Welcome to this program designed to give you an overview of some of the newer products from Maxim Integrated that will offer significant solutions to several DC to DC converter issues. We're going to start the program with a, a, the subject of non-isolated DC to DC buck regulators um, operating up to as much as 24 volt uh, output range. Uh, and we're going to break it up into individual modules. Each one will uh, give a little bit of the technology involved in, in uh, ap applying these devices and a little bit of, of the background involved in the, in the operation of the circuit. So we're going to start with the first one, which is basically just an introduction. And with the, it, we're going to introduce that with going back to a linear voltage regulator just to understand the idea of voltage regulation that is intended to provide a constant output voltage regardless of variations in either input voltage or the demands for current by the load. And the way that's done in a linear regulator is to insert some kind of an impedance that can be controlled so that the amount of impedance will be whatever is necessary to represent the voltage drop between input and output at whatever load current is flowing uh, or is demanded by the, by the load. But that variable impedance does in fact represent a power loss in the overall regulator system and it is proportional to the voltage drop across it and the load current passing through it. Um, and the efficiency turns out to be fundamentally uh, limited to the ratio of the output to the input voltages, and that can't be changed. So we're going to look at, uh, or the reason, the incentive for going into switching regulator topologies was to be able to address this power loss uh, that is necessary to provide voltage regulation with a linear regulator. So with a switching regulator, we, we have replaced that variable resistance, which is dissipating power in the linear regulator, with a switch. And of course, because we're switching the input voltage, we have to also add a filter to take that chopped input voltage and filter it into delivering a DC voltage, a direct voltage, a steady state voltage to the output. Um, the switch, of course, has very little power dissipation because when it's closed, there is no voltage across it, and when it's open, there's no current flowing through it, so its loss is effectively zero. And if we design this filter with idealized uh, storage elements of an inductor and a capacitor idealized, then there's no power loss there either. That filter just temporarily stores energy and then delivers it. And with this approach, we theoretically could build a 100% efficient regulator. So let's look at the uh, practical applications of how we actually implement that and what it means to real life switching regulators. So the first question is, the output filter, and that's shown in schematic form in the upper right-hand figure, uh, the schematic, which shows that there is a series inductor and an output capacitor. The series inductor is providing a, a means of providing a steady current to the output, even though the switch may be opening and closing. And the capacitor is designed to provide a steady output voltage because of the storage capabilities of that capacitor. The diode is there because that if the inductor is going to be able to provide constant current, uh, when the switch is open, there has to be a pass for that. And that's provided for that uh, diode, which provides current through the inductor when the switch is open. So the operation of that circuit is shown in the waveforms down below where we've shown in the upper waveform the switch activation being off to on, repetitively off to on uh, as a function of time. And the bottom waveform shows the voltage that is generated right at the left-hand side of the inductor at the junction point between the switch and the rectifier and the inductor. We call that point the switch switching node because that's where the voltage switching waveform shows. 
and you can see that voltage will either be the input voltage when the switch is closed, or it will be slightly below ground when the switch is open and diode current is flowing. So depending upon the duty cycle, that uh, uh, output voltage will have a slight upward tend, trend when in, uh, current is increasing, uh, when the switch is on, and a slight downward trend when the, um, when the uh, uh, voltage uh, at the uh, switch node is zero, and it's only the inductor current that's provided in the output. And that voltage can range between the input voltage and the ground, and we can see that easily because if the switch is closed continuously, then the output voltage will ultimately be the input voltage. And if the switch is open continuously, the output voltage will either be zero, will definitely be zero. So the action of opening and closing with some duty cycle of ratio of on to off time, we will be able to control the output voltage somewhere between the input voltage and down to ground. But of course, we really only want to hold the output voltage constant, but the same action takes place to accommodate variations in input voltage or load current demand. And, we've, and we control that by means of the schematic shown in the lower left-hand corner where we're sensing the output voltage and using that to generate a pulse width modulation command. And that establishes the on to off ratio, which is defined as the duty cycle. And as you can see from the upper equation on the left-hand side, the overall gain of this, of this power stage is that the output is going to be equal to the input times the duty cycle. Now the question then comes up, well, how do we generate this variable pulse width modulation? And here's the circuitry it takes to do that. Uh, you can see, first of all, that we're going to measure, sense the output voltage. Uh, we do that by a feedback signal that comes in from the left-hand side of that block diagram uh, from sensing the output voltage. And we're going to compare that uh, to a reference voltage, which is a fixed voltage, and the, the difference between those two will generate an analog error command that will identify how much energy we need to maintain the, um, the, the regulated output voltage, which means drive the feedback signal down to where, or to where it equals the voltage on the reference. And we do that uh, well, the second thing that this circuit has is a, is a timing function which needs an oscillator. And we have an oscillator there that is designed to provide a fixed frequency, a steady state fixed frequency that sets the switching speed, uh, the switching frequency of the overall regulator. But it does another function in this circuit as well because it also generates a sawtooth ramp waveform, which is shown in red. Um, in the waveforms down in the lower portion of this picture. The logic is set up by a PWM comparator which compares this ramp voltage waveform to the voltage of the, uh, out of the error amplifier which is essentially telling how much energy is needed to maintain regulation at the output. And if we look at that signal, we've shown it in the waveforms as a green um, line which, if not much energy is required, will be fairly low. And the logic is set so that the action of the ramp waveform resetting itself by going from the peak immediately down to the valley turns on the power switch. And you see that in the lower waveform with the rising um, edge of that output pulse, which is triggered by the ramp waveform being uh, down at, or, or going down to its minimum value. And then as it starts up, at some point in time, it crosses the voltage that is defined by the error amplifier, the green line, and when that occurs, that's the signal to turn off the power switch. And you can see when there's not much energy required, the, the green output from the error amplifier is low, and the resultant pulse width is relatively narrow. But if there becomes a, a, a low drain on the output and we get a signal that says <clears throat> we need more energy, 
that the air amplifier raises the control voltage, and now when the ramp uh, uh, starts its upward trek, it doesn't cross the voltage at the air amplifier's output until later in the period, and that then sends the turn off command to a later time, which gives you a longer pulse foot as shown in the waveforms at the bottom. So we can get a, a pulse width modulation that can control the output from zero up to equal to the input voltage as the uh, error signal goes from below the ramp valley to above the ramp peak. Now the output stage um, is, consists of an output filter and a rectifier as we have shown and of course the power switch which is driving that output circuit and the circuit we had originally described uh, is shown in the top. Uh, we call this a buck regulator um, and it is one of the most widely used versions but it's not the only. As you can see there are two other configurations which are, which are developed with the same components but just in, interconnected in a different way. The implications on the upper uh, schematic, which we've described earlier, which we're calling the buck circuit, is that this is a step-down regulator. The output voltage has to be lower than the input because we have said that with 100% uh, switch closure, the output will go up only to the input, and that's as high as it can go. The action of the circuit is also set up so that the, as the switch pulses on and off, the inductor current will rise and fall but is always flowing through, um, through the inductor and on out to the output load and the output capacitor. And it's either getting the current from the switch or from the rectifier depending upon whether the switch is on or off. Rearranging these components into the middle topology, we see we put the inductor on the input side between the input voltage and the power switch which goes down to ground. And now when we close that switch, we're not doing anything on the output. We are merely grounding the uh, one end of the inductor where the other end is at the input voltage and so current can increase in that input inductor and as it increases, it's storing energy in the inductance of the inductor. In the meantime, on the output, since the switch is closed, the anode of the rectifier is at ground and therefore if there's any voltage at all on the output, the rectifier is reverse biased and there can be no current um, in the output circuit and the capacitor alone is maintaining the output, um, ma maintaining energy to the load. And then when the power switch is open, the current that was flowing down through the power switch will now want to find a continued path to flow and the only way it can do that is by raising the voltage up to forward biasing the rectifier so it can then flow out, flow out to the output and recharge the charge on the output capacitor. This circuit will only work with output voltages above the input voltage. So we call it a boost circuit and it is not as widely used but it does generate an output voltage higher than the input voltage and can do it under controlled uh, regulated means by means of regulating the duty cycle as the equations there on the left show. But it's a two-step process. Um, in the upper, in the buck circuit in the upper schematic, current was continuously flowing from the, to the output. In the boost circuit and in the, the bottom one as well, it's only flowing to the output in pulses and only flowing when the switch is open. When the switch is closed, we're storing the energy in the inductor. When the switch is open, that energy is transferred to the output and that's when we get our uh, replenishing of the energy into the output capacitor. So it's a two-step two process in that path. And the reason and the, the implication of that is we have to have higher currents because we got to get all the energy that we're going to need into just the portion of the duty cycle when the switch is closed. The flyback circuit is essentially the same circuit but just rearranging the components and what it does is still charge the inductor when the switch is closed, 
Only now when the switch is open, the inductor current to continue the flow flows in the negative direction, so that del delivers a negative output voltage. So this circuit is a polarity inverter, taking a positive voltage and developing a negative voltage, and again regulating it by means of pulse width modulation. And again, being a two-step energy transfer process. The circuitry it takes to do that, the controlling portion of that circuit is all small signal components, and the, the thing that uh, first started um, the, uh, the growth of this process was when he in we integrated all of that low-power low control circuitry into a single chip. And now there's uh, hundreds if not thousands of control circuits that take care of all the control circuit into a single chip, and that portion of the circuitry was easily integrated. Over on the right-hand side, we see the power components. Those have been more challenging, and it's taken more effort to try to make more modular or, mi or minimized uh, packaging for those. Over on the right-hand, I'm sorry, the left-hand side of this picture, we're showing some other external circuits that are not shown on the, uh, in the integrated circuit, but they're there to provide all the programming features to adapt the circuit to do uh, many different things by the way you would set up these programming components. But they are fairly low power devices as well, and we now have circuits that have integrated those um, as, as we have integrated many of the power components as well. Um, and we have got, um, the, the, what you sacrifice when you take the programming circuitry and putting it uh, inside on the chip, you limit the versatility of that chip, but you find much greater utility and uh, much greater cost savings to the user as well as uh, reducing the, the component count. So the evolution, the evolution of this process of, of, of power supply development has been to take the basic regulating functions and add in all the specialized functions. We could put, of course, a lot more uh, features into this control circuit that are done with the, you know, the basic um, uh, low power uh, uh, analog functions and are done now so that uh, control circuits are much more powerful in terms of the function that, that they control. And, and still, we have been able to integrate those very readily. This is the evolutionary diagram of how the, the technology has progressed. When we started with only integrating the switching controller over on the left-hand side, we added on the same chip of silicon the FET drivers with a little more effort, but we're able to get a more versatile circuit. And then with a big step forward, we're putting integrated power MOSFETs up into the 10 amp region, now onto our integrated circuits. Um, and so that provides all of the silicon um, that is required uh, into a single chip. <clears throat> and as I also mentioned earlier, the incorporation of the programming functions as well as the cons compensation circuitry um, is a, a, a fourth level of integration that greatly improves the ease of use by uh, requiring much less work for the designer to adapt the circuit to a particular application because these uh, functions are now built in onto the chips. And finally, there is that output filter, uh, and it's a little tougher challenge here because energy storage typically does, by its very nature, require some kind of volume consideration. Um, there's uh, dielectric in a capacitor, there's uh, magnetic material in an inductor, and these aren't easily integrated into silicon, but they have been made much smaller in size. And now what you're seeing is the beginnings of a next level of integration, integrating at the package level, um, where we've been able to put miniaturized output filter components uh, into the same package with all the rest of the circuitry. So that's where we have, uh, where we are and where we've come from. Um, we've talked about the basic switching regulating uh, components and circuitry, and the next module in this series will talk about the ways they can be controlled, different control algorithms that handle the, the uh, dynamics of the switching. <laughs>